Today it's really a, a privilege and pleasure to talk to you about ultraviolet light, the original source, and how to use it. And before I start, I'd like to uh, thank my colleagues, uh, Frank Garland, Cedric Garland, and Sharif Moore. And it's uh, very wonderful to have you here, Frank. Um, before um, we start talking about ultraviolet light, I, I know we uh, sang a wonderful song. I'm, I'm not going to sing it again, but <laughs> we sang uh, You Are My Sunshine, and it brought to mind another song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And it's a, uh, a song popularized by Judy Garland, of course, in The Wizard of Oz. And I, uh, the rainbow is kind of a theme in, in this presentation. I'm, I'm not going to be talking about the rainbow per se, but and maybe not even photons that are over the rainbow, but photons that are in the vicinity of the rainbow, specifically ultraviolet B photons, which are beyond the ultraviolet. I have uh, no relationships to the rainbow to disclose, uh, <laughs> my colleagues, uh, no proprietary interest in sunlight. We just enjoy being out in it and out in some of the finest UVB photons that Southern California can offer today. So I hope everyone got to go outside and, and experience that. Even though you can't see them, they're there. Between 10 and, and 2, you can feel the infrared, you can feel the warmth, you can see the bright, beautiful colors of the rainbow. But uh, with ultraviolet B, it's a very particular set of of photons. Most people have a favorite color. Does anyone have a favorite color? Red, Red yellow. purple, yellow? Well, in a sense, you have a favorite set of photons. And I am going to try to convince you that perhaps you should uh, think of a new set of favorite photons that you can't detect with your eye. The objectives of the presentation today will be to identify environmental, behavioral, constitutive, and constitutive risk factors for vitamin D syndrome. And this is the first time that I'm aware of that um, anyone has presented publicly the notion of vitamin, D, of vitamin D syndrome, of vitamin D deficiency syndrome. Syndrome comes from a Greek word that I can't quite pronounce that means uh, runs together, and in medicine, a syndrome is a, a constellation of, of uh, medical signs and symptoms with a single underlying cause. So I'm going to present to you today uh, a number of uh, disease outcomes that are associated with vitamin D deficiency. And then at the end of the day, I, I think uh, I'd like to hold an informal poll uh, and that we could all vote and decide whether or not we should recognize a vitamin D syndrome. Uh, there, there was a similar vote in, in Prague in 2006, and at that vote, uh, Pluto lost its status as a planet. Now, I know a lot of us might miss Pluto, but uh, there, there was a vote, and it, was, it, it happened. And, and today, though, we, we have a chance to vote on, on something else, and it's an outcome of great public health significance. So as, as I go through this uh, presentation, I hope in the back of your mind you'll be thinking about the uh, possibility of recognition of a vitamin D deficiency syndrome as, as a, uh, a major public health challenge. We'll also, uh, in this uh, exploration, describe cutaneous evolutionary ad adaptations to use ultraviolet B, and we have many. We've, we've evolved with the sun. We've evolved to use these specific wavelengths for vitamin D photosynthesis. And, and we'll, we'll uh, look at those in some detail. I'd also hope that by the end of the presentation you could identify the portion of the ultraviolet B spectrum that's available for making vitamin D. And then finally, make recommendations for yourselves and others for the optimal 25 OHD concentration for any patient, whether it results from sun exposure or from supplementation. And we've seen a lot of uh, wonderful dose response work from uh, Dr. Cedric Garland this morning that provides evidence for that, that, exact, um, that exact kind of decision. So vitamin D deficiency as a syndrome. Um, one, one famous syndrome is Marfan syndrome, uh, 
Uh, Abraham Lincoln may have had it. it. It involves an elongated skeleton. It puts people at high risk for uh, coronary vascular disease and other skeletal abnormalities. Well, vitamin D deficiency syndrome doesn't affect connective tissue per se, but it, uh, it does affect intercellular communications in epithelial tissue, tight junctions. And of course, as a hormone, 125 uh, OHD regulation uh, is very important in calcium homeostasis. And there are a myriad of health consequences to consider when you consider vitamin D deficiency as a syndrome. These include increased risk of at least 17 different sites for cancer. And we have, a, we have William Grant here who's described those in some detail and uh, our colleague Sharif Moore, who, who's worked in this uh, tabulation and review as well. Uh, there's multiple sclerosis, uh, very compelling pre-diagnostic serum studies that show a uh, remarkable uh, reduction in incidence of multiple sclerosis with increased uh, levels of, uh, of 25 OHD in serum, whether it came from diet or sun exposure. Seasonal influenza, well, we call it seasonal influenza, and. There's a reason, and I'm, I'm going to show the profound influence of season on ultraviolet B flux at ground level. And I think you'll start to appreciate uh, how important uh, season is and your ability to photosynthesize vitamin D. Diabetes, muscle pain and weakness. Uh, we've heard uh, about pregnancy complications, uh, uh, maternal hypertension, preeclampsia, prematurity. Uh, impaired wound healing. Uh, there is a constellation of infectious and uh, healing uh, uh, impairments that are associated with vitamin D deficiency syndrome. Well, let's talk about UVB photons. They, they're, they're some of my favorite photons. They allow vitamin D photosynthesis. And even though you don't know what color they are, they're, they're very important. The sun, of course, is the source of UVB photons that are used to make vitamin D. And of all the solar photons in all the beaches and all uh, at ground level, just only about 0.5%, 0.5% are useful in vitamin D photosynthesis. And these photons are just a very specific kind of photon between 297 and 309 nanometers wavelength. And it's not that uh, shorter photons won't make vitamin D, but they just aren't available through the atmosphere. And longer photons don't make vitamin D. They're in the UVA and, well, the uh, far, the near U, uh, UV. But what we're really uh, talking about when we're talking about vitamin D photosynthesis is just this little sliver of the spectrum. So I, I'll show that to you now. <laughs> and there it is. So you can see the traditional ultraviolet B range, 280 to 319 nanometers. That's the conventional erythemal range that's usually uh, spoken of. And then the ultraviolet A range from 320 up to the very tip of the visible spectrum, some people might be able to perceive a 400 nanometer wavelength light uh, with their eyes. So insects can see into the, uh, the near UVA, and, and honeybees, for example, use that light in the evening to find flowers. Uh, but um, our eyes, to our eyes, it's insensible. But what I want to point out on this slide, oh, thank you, perfect timing, Carol, is, is how much energy there is in the UVA. It's startling. Here's, here's the whole spectrum of visible light that we've evolved to use for vision. And, and look at all this UVA. And, and these are the joules, uh, the amount of energy per square meter that actually reaches ground level on a, on a clear day. And, and uh, it's just this little tiny bit that is responsible for vitamin D photosynthesis. And, and, and yet there, there's all this UVA. And there's some consequences to that. And we'll see uh, our uh, uh, cutaneous adaptations to uh, protect ourselves from this portion and use this portion. And we'll also see some technological innovations that have, have uh, turned that upside down. This is the uh, uh, pathway for vitamin D synthesis in the skin. Here, here's, of course, the visible light and many people's favorite colors here. Here's my favorite photon group. And here's where the 7-dehydroxycholesterol uh, 
becomes vitamin D upon exposure to these photons. Warmth, either from the infrared or from, from circulation, drives this forward to vitamin D3, colocalciferol, the animal form. If you're a mushroom, you could make ergocalciferol, but uh, <laughs> this is uh, what happens in human skin. Uh, then uh, here's a, it, this uh, circulates into the plasma where it goes to the liver, becomes hydroxylated at the 25th position to become 25D3. And then uh, this is, has been recognized uh, since 1997 is the major indicator of vitamin D status. This, and it's a, it's a wonderful biomarker. It's, it's, a, it's a critical biomarker. People know their cholesterol. They know their triglyceride level. Everyone should know their 25 OHD. And it's important to know your, the 25 OHD levels of your patients. And this uh, in, can in turn be hydro, uh, hydroxylated again at the first position in the kidney and various other places throughout the body where the autocrine uh, functions occur. Now, this, now UVB, the, f the photons available for vitamin D photosynthesis, vary tremendously by season and latitude and other factors. And here's the sun over the equator. And as it moves up to the solstice, there, it's, it's, it's as though you move the equator up uh, to 23.4 degrees. But the path length of the, of the sun down to the Tropic of Capricorn at 23.4 degrees south is, is really huge through the atmosphere. And, and that's why we have such profound changes in winter. UVB can't penetrate very easily. It's very fragile, and it doesn't get through this thick layer of atmosphere. And I, I've made what I call the flashlight beam model here. And you can see if you, if you uh, oh, this is laser. It's great. But if you, if you uh, fire a flashlight straight at a wall, you get this very uh, concentrated uh, uh, visible energy. But if you shine it obliquely, you, it, it's spread over more surface area. Well, this combines with a filtering of the atmosphere to just um, eliminate ultraviolet B light in the winter. And I'll show you some, some models uh, of that uh, in just a moment. This is a, uh, a very unusual uh, map of, of the globe. Now, on this map, it is always noon everywhere on the planet. It's solar noon. It's a completely clear day. There's not a cloud in the sky. And it happens to be on the summer solstice. So it's the rosiest picture for vitamin D photosynthesis imaginable. It's, a, it's clear air. It's a, it's a model that's uh, just, uh, well, it gets me kind of excited because there's so much opportunity for vitamin D photosynthesis here. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and you can do it. You st just step outside on a day like, uh, well, this hypothetical uh, global condition. And anywhere in the world, it's noon, and it's a solar maximum. And you can make a 10,000 IU of vitamin D uh, standing out for 10 minutes with uh, your, your shirt off or in shorts, tank top, depending on gender, and uh, make quite a lot of uh, vitamin D in just a very short time. So uh, unfortunately, this is hypothetical. And we have a lot of uh, air pollution. We have cloud cover. And uh, Dr. Uh, Mizui described how uh, it's, it's uh, cloudy often in Japan. And not uh, down here, it's clear. We're in a desert. And um, that cloud cover is, uh, has a profound influence on, on the ability of UVB to penetrate the atmosphere. So, so this is, um, this is a, a, a model of just how good it could be, but it never is. Uh, so it's, it's just impossible to, to get this kind of uh, UVB erythemal picture. Now let's go to the other extreme. This is uh, all, all the northern hemisphere has disappeared. It's in black. And that's because now we're at the uh, winter solstice. And, uh, there's a very nice opportunities for vitamin D photosynthesis in South America and South Africa and Australia. North, you know, uh, but unfortunately, uh, nothing. You know, it's vitamin D winter. And this is, this is not even considering uh, cloud cover and air pollution and the fact that it's freezing cold and people are wearing clothes. So you know, <laughs> that's a, those are uh, not taken into account in this model. But the model is. Uh, elegant, and it's well described in, in this uh, 
uh, paper this, uh, from the European Space Agency. It uses uh, total ozone measuring satellites, and it's a, it's a very, very wonderful model. <coughs> Well, now we can see the, the um, outcome. We've described the environment, um, and, and this shows data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And in the winter, this uh, risk of, of, of uh, hypovitaminosis D, severe, uh, less than 17 nanograms per ml vitamin D, is, is set at one. Well, this risk goes down a little in the fall. It's lowest in the summer. And uh, here, here's uh, springtime. So uh, right now we're um, right. You know we've, we're coming coming out of the winter and going into spring. And this is a good time to measure people's vitamin D status because you, you get the uh, well, you, you get an assessment of the nadir of of, of the lowest level and. And, and, that, that, and that's really important. You, if, you, if you generalize and you go to the summer and sample all your patients then, you're, you're going to have a much more optimistic uh, view of, of their actual average vitamin D status over the year. Uh, season has a profound effect. And, and this is from N. Haynes. And interestingly enough, there, there is a little bit of a seasonal uh, skew in this uh, sampling. Uh, N. Haynes is very careful to get representative population sampling, uh, probability proportionate to size sampling. They oversample certain populations. But they go north in the winter to get blood samples, and they do that because the, they don't want the trailers to get stuck. Uh, oh, it's a, south in the, yeah. They go south in the winter, right, and north in the summer. Excuse me, thank you. So. Um, so what's happening is uh, you're, you're getting a skewed sample even, even here. So this is actually probably attenuated somewhat because of the sampling scheme. Yeah, th thanks, Bill. I got my hemispheres mixed up. <laughs> so uh, in terms of outcome, we're epidemiologists. What, what, uh, the, we know there's differences in exposure, differences in opportunity for vitamin D photosynthesis. What does this do to disease outcomes? Well, we looked in the... Uh, uh, Department of Defense, and we looked at uh, the incidence of onset of type 1 diabetes. And, and we saw a very uh, interesting seasonal pattern. And these are new cases of diabetes diagnosed in a large cohort. There were uh, 2,918 cases in, a, in about a, a 4 million person year group. These are, these are young people. Uh, and, and this is what we saw. There was a, a, a big uh, seasonal pattern. And in fact, uh, the uh, odds ratio of being diagnosed in the winter-spring season was, was higher, statistically significantly higher, 1.46. So there, there's a uh, suggestion here that vitamin D status right, may be related to onset of type 1 diabetes, and that there's, it's a seasonal effect. This, is, uh, this paper came from a randomized controlled trial that was designed to look at bone loss in postmenopausal women. But um, it happened that the investigators administered a questionnaire and asked about self-reported flu symptoms. And this is a, they, they were, they, they, it was a randomized trial. They gave one group 800 IU of vitamin D and another group 2,000. And uh, you, you can see in the uh, placebo group in the winter, there was a lot more of this uh, seasonal upper respiratory infection, self-reported flu symptoms, and that this was uh, f f flatter in this, in, in, uh, at this time of year, and that uh, vitamin D attenuated that, and in fact it disappeared in the 2000 IU group. This is a uh, study from Norway, uh, and uh, this has to do with season of diagnosis and, and prostate cancer survival. And in the winter and spring, we see this uh, this, this uh, high-risk group is, is arbitrarily set at one, the referent population, and we see a 20 percent uh, increase in, uh, in survival, and this was in uh, three-year survival rates for prostate cancer, just based on, on when the uh, diagnosis occurred, and uh, 46,000 cases. Nor Norway has a, a wonderful uh, health system. 
Now let's look at the situation in, in the United States, in our country. Uh, here is um, a sample from, this is the whole sample from Ann Haynes, who had uh, blood draws, all, all genders, all races. And you can see that 74% uh, of this population was below 32 nanograms per ml. That's clinical vitamin D insufficiency. And, and, and that has profound consequences and has led to uh, really an epidemic of what I uh, hope you might accept as, as vitamin D deficiency syndrome related illnesses. Now we, we've talked a little about physical activity. Um, this is uh, showing a, the one, one group again as, as having a low physical activity. This is from Ann Haynes, self-reported physical activity. Now a lot of this uh, physical activity uh, doubtlessly occurs outside. Some of it might be related to body mass index, and there is a, a body mass index finding here too. But um, if outdoor physical activity is protective against severe vitamin D, uh, hypovitaminosis D, below 17.8 nanograms per ml. That's, that's a very, very low indeed. <clears throat> well, does physical activity affect cancer incidence? This is, this is from N. Haynes 1. This is about, a, this was published uh, ten, uh, nine years after uh, Frank and Cedric's paper. So we can fr perhaps forgive the authors for not uh, mentioning vitamin D in the article at all. But they did uh, look at physical activity, and there's a clue here. This was all cancer incidents uh, in N. Haynes 1. And the uh, low physical activity folks are at 80% uh, uh, higher risk than the high physical activity group. And let's see, maybe this will go backwards. Let's see. Oh, here we are. So, um, you know, this, there's a real possibility that the physical activity might be a marker for vitamin D status. And it would be interesting to stratify physical activity by whether it's indoors or outdoors and finally tease this apart. But uh, physical activity in cancer is a, a huge literature. And uh, now I think it's being a Maybe the spotlight has been shifted over to vitamin D from, from uh, physical activity, which may have turned out to be an indirect association. And yet there's a clue here, and it's a well-done study, and, and uh, I think it's an indication of, uh, of the importance of vitamin D and its uh, correlation with physical activity. Now I'd just like to turn to gender, and we, we heard a... In, um, it's a wonderful uh, presentation about the problems women encounter in pregnancy and childbirth. Uh, women are at, at a two, two and a quarter, 2.26 2 times increased risk in NHANES for severe vitamin D deficiency. And if they're uh, heavily pigmented women, the situation is even more profound, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, th you know, this has real, real consequences for uh, women in childbirth and, and certainly in, in breast cancer. Now we're turning to uh, constitutive pigmentation. Uh, this, is, this shows uh, from N. Haynes the uh, uh, rate of uh, the odds ratio for being vitamin D, D deficient, severely vitamin D deficient in blacks compared to whites, Hispanic, and other are also elevated. And uh, this is extremely statistically significant. And it's a, an extreme uh, public health challenge. The Institute of Medicine will have to, I believe, focus and make recommendations based on, on uh, pigmentation, gender, physical activity, and body mass index. Because when it comes to vitamin D, one size doesn't fit all. But we do have the universal marker, 25 OHD, to rely on. So that's uh, where we should turn our attention and, and not just say 400 IU is enough for everyone. It's, it's uh, you know, clearly not enough, and it, it's, a, it's not a, a one-size-fits-all situation. Now I'd like to uh, uh, talk about the uh, human photoprotective response, some of the uh, um, adaptations in our skin that have evolved to use vitamin, or use ultraviolet B for vitamin D photosynthesis, and yet uh, protect ourselves from UVA. This is uh, the situation in unexposed light-colored skin. There's the melanocyte, keratinocytes. These are little melanin packets, 
and here's the basal layer, the, the uh, stratum corneum, the, the horny layer, sometimes called sp spinosum. And let's uh, see what happens when I press this button. Here's the UVA. Notice how in unaccommodated skin, the UVA goes very deeply into the skin. It's, it's powerful. You can transilluminate your, your, your cheek with a flashlight. I don't know if you ever did that when you were a kid. You, you, uh, but um, it, UVA is like that. It can go way down in, deep into the skin. And it hits the melanocytes, there's no question about it, where it causes a lot of oxidative damage. It used to be thought that UVB was the culprit in malignant melanoma. UVA can reach the melanocytes and makes a lot of uh, photooxidative products that can be very damaging. Here's a, our favorite UVB photons coming down. And, and uh, these photons are the ones that initiate the human photoprotective response. These are all the, also the photons that are completely blocked by chemical sunscreens. So chemical sunscreens you know, block uh, tanning, obviously, and, and sunburn. But they also block the human photoprotective response. So let's see. Here's, here's what happens in response to the UVB. The stratum corneum thickens. And also, the melanocytes are stimulated to make more melanin. This is the uh, pheomelanin, the, the dark melanin that uh, is so effective in protecting the skin. There's also a eumelanin, the kind of reddish melanin that's a little less effective. Uh, and now we see that the, uh, here's the melanin that's been uh, induced by the UVB, and it's blocking the UVA and uh, attenuating the UVB, but the vitamin D photosynthesis can still occur in the upper layers of the skin here. So it's, uh, uh, this is a response to UVB that protects the skin from UVA that's completely obviated by the uh, application of UVA blocking sunscreens. Now within, this is sort of a close up view of, of the keratinocytes, within the keratinocytes there, there's a, a migration of, of the melanin as well. And they go to the apex of the nucleus in the distal region and protect the nucleus. So it's a very interesting adaptation. And uh, it's uh, illustrated here in this uh, cartoon. <clears throat> well, here's a bottle of sunscreen. This is uh, for, for children. Uh, it's a 45 SPF. You're supposed to put it on often because they're kid might go swimming and be sure to, you know, reapply frequently. And, and um, you know, I think we have to look at whether this is a good idea. Now, this little girl's been around for about 50 years. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> uh, people think sunscreen's a recent invention, but uh, she's, she's been, been around for a while. So, um, you know, I, I think we have to decide whether we like this or not. And <clears throat> Well, this is, uh, these are the dates of introduction of, of suntan lotions and sunscreens. Now they're called sunblocks, which is, uh, a sunscreen is at least a little more descriptive because the sunscreens have huge holes in them. The sunblock, it's, it, it's, it's really not a sunblock, as you'll see. Here's the um, homosalate and the famous paraminobenzoic acid that were introduced in the late 40s. At, those, at that time, they were called suntan lotions. They helped you get a tan. Then they became sunscreens and later sunblocks. Okay, well here's uh, Pab, really popularized. We're getting up to SPF six or eight now. Whoa. Okay, now we're up to twenty, and these are the higher erythema blocks. And then I wanted to transpose this over age-adjusted malignant melanoma rates. Well, you know, uh, uh, there's a temporal sequence here. It's a, it could be coincidence. Okay, now I'd like to show the ultraviolet B uh, range here, the terrestrial range. And this is the absorption spectrum of PABA. And it really wipes it out, uh, as you can see. Uh, PABA is a pretty good it's a bacterial vitamin, and it's good at blocking UVC, and it blocks uh, UVB, but nothing in the UVA. It's transparent to the UVA. So it maintains the skin in this very transparent state by blocking human photoprotective response that I showed. And, and allows uh, the UVA to, uh, 
tr to uh, penetrate this unaccommodated skin. It also allows thousands of times the exposure to UVA. So, uh, because normally a person would get a sunburn after half an hour, but if they're, take, if they're wearing 45, they can stay out 45 times as long. That's really what that, that number means. So it's, uh, you know, dermatologists say, well, don't go out in the sun, but if you go out, wear this. It'll let you stay out 45 times longer. Well, does that make sense? Uh, I think we have to reevaluate re sunscreens. It, it, and uh, they've, they've never been shown in a randomized controlled trial to prevent malignant melanoma. I think if sunscreens were a pill that you swallowed, maybe the FDA would have paid more attention to them. But since they're just rubbed on the integument, they're considered a cosmetic. But they have this very powerful effect. They've irrevocably changed a relationship, a very ancient relationship between our skin and the sun. And it's one that, it's, an, it's a relationship that has evolved over millennia. So I, we should be very careful about putting these powerful chemicals on our skin, untested powerful chemicals. Well, here's uh, our friend Paba again. And this is uh, the action spectrum for melanoma. Uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Setlow and Associates who looked at a, a fish model of melanoma. And in this uh, very nice uh, sword tail platy, attractive aquarium fish. Uh, and Dr. Setlow no noted he had an ultraviolet A light. And, and some of the uh, tanks he covered with a filter, and some he didn't. And the tanks he didn't cover, uh, these uh, little sword tail platys got these uh, big melanomas on their fins. So, so here's where Pob is absorbing, and here's where melanoma is being induced. Not very helpful, for the fish at least. Now we see here uh, the UVB portion of the spectrum and the UVA. And this is another sunscreen compound, one of the ones that's called broad spectrum. Well. Not too broad. It doesn't even get into the UVA, and uh, it's but it's a modern one, octomethacinamate, and it's in various solvents here. And you can see that it's a, it, still absorbing in the UVB, but transparent in the UVA. Now there's an odd characteristic of these, like fluorescent light, like a, like day glow paint. These compounds absorb in the UVB, then they have to do something with that energy, so they fluoresce it in the UVA. So they take those our favorite photons, and change their wavelength, and, and then fluoresce them in the UVA. It's a minimal contribution compared to the total flux of UVA, but it's, it's taking our, our favorite photons and making them into the bad actors when it comes to malignant melanoma. Here's UVB, uh, the absorption spectrum of PABA. Absorption here, uh, emission there. You, you, of course, you can't see UVA, but it's the, the, the day glow paint absorbs in the UVA and fluoresces in the visible, and that's why it has that preternatural glow about it. Uh, and this is doing the same thing in the, with the UVB and then fluorescing in the UVA. This is the big uh, hope for the cosmetics industry. Uh, the Mexerol has just been licensed in the United States recently. And here's its uh, absorption spectrum. Uh, this is Mexerol here, actually. And it, it gets out into the UVA pretty well. It doesn't absorb as well in the UVB. And what happens is uh, people would buy this, and they'd put it on, and they'd get a sunburn. And they'd say, oh, this is very good sunscreen. So they mix it with a, a more conventional sunscreen. And then you get the intersection of these two, or, um, the superposition of the absorption spectra. But Mexerol still has a huge hole out here in the near UVA. So it's, you know, it's still keeping your skin transparent because they mix it with these traditional sunscreen formulations. And it's transparent to, uh, to probably about 80% of the UVA energy. Well, our, um, <clears throat> a lot of people have been looking at sunscreen use. I mentioned that there's never been a con clinical trial showing that sunscreens are effective in preventing melanoma. But what we see here is that um, <clears throat> a series of case control studies, and these are organized by their magnitude here. These, these were somewhat protective. They found a protective association between sunscreen use and risk of melanoma, case control studies. These were neutral, one, same risk in the cases of the controls. 
And these people who used a sunscreen had higher risk of melanoma. Well, people organize these sometimes by the year they were done or sometimes by the, they alphabetize them by the author's last name. But our, our group thought, well, there's seven of them that are elevated, five that aren't statistically significant, and four where there was a protective effect. What if we looked at that by latitude? And so we did that, and interestingly enough, in high latitude, fair, skinned populations, the sunscreens tended to be very uh, risky. <laughs> the use of sunscreen was associated with increased risk. And, as you, and in fact, when you pooled it, it's 40% uh, higher. Now, if you looked at the uh, uh, lower latitude, Spain, and well, here, here we're seeing uh, southern hemisphere, uh, populations that generally tend to be more heavily pigmented, we see a, a nil or somewhat protective effect. And it's, um, it's a very interesting finding because the people who are most vulnerable to m melanoma tend to be fair-skinned. They burn easily, and they might rely more on, on heavy use of chemical sunscreen. So they're really precisely the people who probably shouldn't be using them. And you can explain quite a lot of the variation in these odds ratios just by knowing the latitude, 35% of the variation. That's <clears throat> now, here's a, the, here are the data from the uh, Connecticut Tumor Registry for malignant melanoma in the United States. And it's um, a, a very uh, rapidly increasing epidemic in our, in our country. The Connecticut Tumor Registry is one of the oldest tumor registries in the United States. I, I think the point's been made that correlation isn't causation, but of course there's no causation without correlation. And these are annual sunscreen sales, millions of dollars. And you know, it's, a, it's potentially a coincidence. The price of peanut butter, uh, gasoline, you know, maybe there are other things, but this is pretty interesting. Uh, sunscreens and, and free speech. Whether consumers are told that a product has an SPF rating at a specific level above 30, or that a product containing sunscreens helps prevent skin aging, it is difficult to see how the transmission of such information results in real harm. John uh, Roberts was a cosmetics industry lawyer in 2001. He's now the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And um, I think uh, there's a potential that this kind of speech results in real harm. <clears throat> well, whether sunscreens are effective in vampires or not, they're, they're probably not protecting people from malignant melanoma. And they're certainly increasing people's risk for, vita for hypovitaminosis D. Donald forgot your sunblock. Oh, tough. Well, now I'd like to uh, go over some recommendations for vitamin D photosynthesis. The, the topic is using the sun as a, as, as a source for vitamin D photosynthesis. And the guiding principle, I think, has to be to maximize UVA exposure while allowing, or sorry, minimize UVA exposure while allowing beneficial UVB exposure. And uh, if skin type allows, I think it's reasonable to advise 15 to 10 to 15 minutes a day of uh, Sun, sun exposure between 10 and 2. If, a, if, if your patients are heavily pigmented, they'll need to be out longer. And they should be out on a clear day when there's not a lot of uh, air pollution. Uh, they have to expose quite a lot of uh, surface area, 40% of skin area. And um, the, the important thing to uh, minimize UVA exposure is also to control air pollution because air pollution is very destructive to ultraviolet B light. So this is where a public health recommendation and an environmental recommendation will align. Uh, and, and often, that's the case. <laughs> um, when um, season, latitude, skin type, or atmospheric conditions don't allow UVB exposure, uh, or UVB just isn't available, I think uh, it's important to use oral supplementation of vitamin D3, colocalciferol, to achieve circulating levels of between 40 and 60 nanograms per ml, or at least uh, or 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter, if you prefer the uh, European method of uh, evaluating vitamin D status in, in circulation. Th this is a, a kind of a useful rule of thumb and a good target. We're talking about between 40 and 60 nanograms per ml. 
Uh, Dr. Garland showed this slide. It's, it, it's, it's safe to go higher. The, uh, the, the median for NHANES is about 25. To get from 25 to 45, you, you're um, going to need at least a 2,000 IU uh, to get uh, to, to achieve that, 2,000 IU a day. And uh, 4,000 IU would be much safer because many people, this is just the median, it would, you, you'd, you'd help some of the population, but there, uh, half the population is lower. So uh, um, I, I think we're looking at serum targets here. And clinically, you can test for those, and you can try to get your patients there. And uh, that, that's uh, something I would endorse, along with some ultraviolet exposure when, when advisable. Well, these uh, kids have just been out in the sun, and they haven't been indoors playing video games. <laughs> they're wearing some very attractive red hats now because uh, they're uh, out in the afternoon. And you can tell from the shadows. Uh, now, if they stood up, their shadows would be longer than they are tall, and then you can't make any. Uh, you can't. There's no UVB available. So, so now they've put on hats to protect themselves from the UVA. They've had a nice day. They've got a sunny uh, kind of subarethymal dose of rosiness in their skin, and well, they look very happy. Thank you very much. Thank you.